My name's David Siemens. I'm a Transportation Security Special Explosive Detection Canine Handler. I've worked two canines since I came to the Transportation Security Administration, TSA K9 Filbert. He is now retired. He retired December 10th, 2021, after he became K9 of the year for 2021. Now I work TSA K9 Luger, who is a black lab, very young. He's two years old, does great at his job. Been a K9 handler for approximately 30 years. I did 20 years in the Army as a K9 handler, and I've been with Homeland Security for 10 years. This is not an individual award, this is a group award. None of the K9 accolades are earned by just the K9 or the handler. The resources that are needed for this layer of security are unprecedented, but the outcome is all for as proficient as a K9 can. For me, it just highlights my career, elevates me to try harder to mentor more by
interest, um, show concern, um, and, and I think uh, we will continue to make progress uh, in that regard. Um, the other thing that I, I, I'd like to, um, to talk about at every town hall are employee bright spots, and we have several um, this afternoon, and, and let me um, highlight several of our colleagues in TSA. First, at Indianapolis uh, International Airport, Officer Lawatana Bean had just ended her early morning shift when a Southwest Airlines employee and a younger woman approached her in Indianapolis parking garage. Um, moments earlier, the young woman threatened to jump off the fifth floor of the parking garage. So just think about what I just said. Um, she immediately called the coordination center and asked for assistance. And while help was on the way, she stayed with the woman, gave her lunch and a drink, and kept her calm. Her, her compassion may have helped save this person's life. And I just heard that she was recently promoted to LTSO. And so uh, my congratulations to now LTSO Bean at Indianapolis uh, International Airport. Um, the next one is a good catch. You might have seen it in the media. Uh, Boston Logan Airport, 23 uh, weapons in a carry-on bag. I think that's a record number. Um, uh, just being um, alert for, for what's there. I can imagine you know, the, the, um, the surprise um, the officer felt when he saw the x-ray image of, of what was there. Um, but it, it, you know, they found uh, also a, a sword that was in a walk cane that in conversations with the passenger, uh, our team is pretty convinced the passenger actually didn't know there was a sword uh, in, the, in this walking cane. So um, you know, he voluntarily surrendered it to the Massachusetts State Police and he was allowed to continue to fly. Um, and the, uh, the 23 people, I'm, I'm sorry, the other one was at Reagan uh, International Airport that was, that was just in the media. Um, the other one, uh, two ones that are a little bit different than, than the bright spots that I normally highlight. And one is um, in Ukraine, uh, involves Ukraine and the Ukraine uh, Critical Incident Management Group uh, and our Transportation and Security Administration representative in Warsaw, Poland. Um, uh, the, our TSAR there is Brian uh, Krenzian, and what he did was he really helped manage the Ukraine CIMG operations on the ground in Poland. And as you know, most of the refugees coming out of Ukraine are going to Poland uh, by the millions uh, of people. Um, and so he helps um, through airport visits, through FAMS visits, because our federal air marshals have been a, a really key uh, part of this. We had to recertify some airports um, for departures and things of that nature. And he's been really good about providing sit reps uh, going forward. But one of the things that he did that kind of demonstrates, you know, I talked about um, the inherent goodness of the TSA workforce and the selfless service that uh, people in, in this agency represent. Um, he he uh, found uh, an elderly couple at an airport called Chopin Airport who had just escaped Mariupol. And if you've watched the news, Mariupol is that city, industrial city on the southern shore of Ukraine on the Sea of Azov that's been just bombarded by Russian bombs over the past several weeks. Um, and, and this elderly couple was, was leaving Mariupol, uh, and they were preparing to fly to Montreal where they had family. And so what Brian did was he personally um, saw the couple, one, um, one member was 89, one member was 90 years old, and just really helped them through the airport process, make sure they got through screening, make sure they got on their flight uh, and on their way um, to Montreal. And you, know, you can imagine the family's um, uh, comfort knowing that there was somebody from TSA uh, in Poland, helping this uh, elderly couple, their parents, uh, get on a flight so they could get reunited. So, um, you know, those kinds of things, like I've said many times in these bright spots, those are the things that people never forget. And so, Brian, uh, really kudos to you for um, going the extra mile um, and, and doing a really good thing for uh, two people who are escaping a country that is been under constant attack by the Russians for 70 plus days now. Um, the other is at Oklahoma City um, uh, Airport, and I just had the opportunity for the very first time in my life um, to go to Oklahoma. Um, I, was, I was not in Oklahoma City, I was in Tulsa. Um, but Oklahoma City is the hub, Tulsa is one of the, one of the spokes, and, and uh, I had a chance to meet with, with the team out there. Um, but at Will Rogers World Airport uh, in Oklahoma City, TSI, Melissa Cummings, um, called the airport called an airport that had reported a situation where somebody had breached security at the smaller airport. And so um, Melissa was charged with doing the TSA investigation uh, on this case, and she, she called the airport, and she was trying to get more information from the airport as to what they knew about what happened. Um, of course, whenever you're, you're in that process, the other 
end of the conversation says, well, what do you know? Um, and in our protocols, we really can't share what our investigation uh, is showing at that stage. And so she couldn't say much about the incident um, uh, with respect to our investigation, but she did take the proactive step of directing that airport to the local law enforcement contacts she had to see if they could just contact them directly to get the information they needed. Um, as a result of the way she handled that and the, and the courteous and professional manner in which she handled that, um, the airport in turn kept her appraised of what they were hearing. So it was very much a mutually reinforcing uh, process where she directed them to other sources of information, they gathered the information, and then they kept her up to date as to what they were seeing. And the airport um, uh, and the staff there just wanted to make sure that we knew in TSA of the great work that Melissa had done uh, that she didn't need to do. She, she, just, she just could very easily have said, I can't tell you, um, and not help them out at all. But because she did, we ended up getting more information uh, as a result. So, uh, so for, for TSI, Melissa Cummings, uh, thank you for that, that great work as one of our uh, key inspectors uh, in the agency out in Oklahoma City. Um, I mentioned the, um, the 20th anniversary. We did the um, 20th anniversary um, uh, ceremony that memorialized the stand-up of the federalization of Baltimore, Washington uh, International Thurgood Marshall Airport on the 29th of April. The actual date of federalization was the following day, uh, a Saturday. Uh, we had a really good crowd uh, at that ceremony. We had about 35 people at BWI Airport that were there in 2002 uh, when it was stood up. So it was really, really meaningful to see people that had been part uh, of the ceremony. So the very first airport federalized, we, we had that, uh, that, cer uh, that ceremony. It's on uh, YouTube. Um, so I would, I would call that um, to your attention, but um, um, just uh, you know, a great way to, uh, to recognize uh, the work that people done, had, had done, as I said earlier, and DFW coming up uh, in early September on, on your 20th anniversary. So uh, you know, I, I know we'll have uh, celebrations across the country. You, you know, BWI need to go first because they were the first, uh, but we'll see these, these, uh, these ceremonies recognizing the great work back 20 years ago uh, across the country. Uh, next topic is um, on something that I'll explain to you, then I'm going to give Dan McCoy an opportunity to talk for just a couple of minutes about what it really means. Um, we're working on two documents. They're called Doctrine. And what Doctrine is, is Doctrine is actually writing down how it is you behave and how it is you do certain things. It's basically a guide. It sounds kind of high level. It actually is. It's, it doesn't have um, a, a whole bunch of specifics to it. Uh, but we're going to put together uh, a doctrine for the entire agency. Um, because, you know, as you've heard me say before, uh, and I've said it multiple times this afternoon, we're 20. Um, and we need to continue to get um, some of our processes more formalized and more updated to being a now standing 20 year agency that's going to be in existence for a very long time. Um, and part of our effort here is to, to just kind of write down what makes us tick is essentially what doctrine is. Um, why, things, how, why things work and how they work in TSA, how we get the job done. Um, so we're, we're going to do that agency-wide. That's still a work in progress, um, and that we'll be working on that across the summer. Um, but we also worked on an innovation doctrine because I, I think we have done um, just a great job in, in bringing innovation to our operations. And it's not just innovation in technology, it's innovation in process as well. Um, and, but I wanted to make sure that um, we didn't view innovation as a hobby. We had a bunch of hobby projects out there that we saw some potential. They had a lot of potential. We put them in place, and then innovation kind of stopped. Um, and we also wanted to embed um, innovation and avenues to innovate in our frontline workforces. The people that do our mission every single day can see where, hey, changing a process or putting a different technology in place might really help us and have an avenue to, to get that information up um, uh, into headquarters so we can take some action on it. Um, and so I asked um, Dan as our chief innovation officer, and he's out in the next couple of weeks. So Dan, why don't you talk about sporadic and kind of hero led. So when we sat down with the TSA folks across um, the enterprise, we knew we had some of those struggles internally, but we did have a lot of amazing success stories that we could uh, harken back to. So. We did a lot of re, uh, research and leadership discussions. Um, as the administrator mentioned, we worked with some friends at Stanford University uh, who are focused on entrepreneurship and innovation to help us design this document. And what we really came back to was 
to drive a doctrine forward um, in a really meaningful manner, it needs to first embed in the culture. And culture fundamentally isn't what you write down, it is what you reward and what you reprimand in action. So the doctrine is first and foremost a promise across the workforce to hold leadership accountable and hold yourselves accountable to how we can bring innovation forward. So when you see an opportunity to solve a problem, when you have a new idea or there's an emerging challenge, we want everybody to seize it and we want to continue to refine the idea that the only unwavering advantage we can retain over our adversaries is our agility, right? They understand how we operate, they understand how we function. We need to be more agile because they don't always play by the same rules. So the doctrine is not a prescribed set of next steps on how to innovate, but it is the funding fundamental principles and guiding principles that everybody can take so that innovation starts to embed itself in everything that we do. So as the administrator said, over the next few um, that is going to be a field-focused, organic effort to drive innovation um, at the edge. So in the field, we're going to start empowering officers and TSOs with new capabilities, new training, and new modules to help innovate in place, and then where appropriate, work with headquarters to help drive that. We are incredibly excited, and then my team is working as well on an innovation pipeline, which is going to be a curated list of the most impactful innovations that we can drive forward for the agency. And those, again, will all be sourced directly from the field uh, where we think innovation, not for innovation's sake, but for mission success really drives the most impact. So that's we just want to embed it uh, in the organization to make sure it, it continues to flourish. And Dan's job, by the way, as the chief innovation officer is not to be the innovator. Uh, his <laughs> job is to make sure that innovation flourishes. Uh, within the agency and to create the terms and conditions uh, for that to happen. He's done a great job uh, at it and um, uh, we will see the fruits of the labor over the next next several years. Yep. Um, uh, last uh, two, to two topics for me, uh, one is on pay equity. Um, it's moving forward. Uh, I just talked to uh, the chairwoman of our House Appropriations Subcommittee just before I came down here. Um, she is very, very supportive of it. Um, and, uh, and I will continue to advocate for this at every turn. I've got two meetings uh, in person up on Capitol Hill tomorrow to talk about this very topic. So um, it's in the, as you know, it's in the President's budget. Um, people have recognized, I haven't heard a single person say that they don't support it. Um, it's going to be figuring out how it gets funded and how they can move the money around, I think more than anything else. Um, so I'll keep you updated on that, but just l want to let you know, good dialogue, I mean, this is, this is the time of year in the annual federal appropriations process where the president submits the budget and then um, agency heads get the opportunity to testify at a hearing on the budget. That's coming up for us um, at the end of May. Um, and, uh, and then the Congress does their work in deciding what they can fund and what they can't fund um, and what they're going to approve and what they're not going to approve. But we'll keep you updated every step of the way. Um, uh, and and um, the other thing that I, I emphasize to the chairwoman is that um, hey, the funding that, that you provide for the, um, the positions that we can't fill right now is really important for us to keep um, because we use that funding to provide all the incentives that we provide for our workforce. And so I just wanted to emphasize to her that, hey, this is a very competitive labor market. We want to retain uh, all the talent that we have within the agency. have always wanted to do that. Um, and the incentives that we provide are really important. And I know you've, you've seen roll out the summer incentives uh, for the screening workforce. So, um, uh, and I appreciate um, people volunteering to work overtime um, to close the capability gaps that we know we have. Um, last thing, as you saw, the President uh, sent out an announcement that he intended to nominate me as the uh, TSA Administrator for five more years. I will tell you that I am thrilled uh, with that. Um, when, when I was asked, um, what I said was, um, whenever the president asks you to do something, your answer is always yes, I believe. Um, and secondly, um, I really, really enjoy this job. I enjoy working with everybody uh, in this agency. I think uh, we have continued to build on the foundation of TSA over the last five years. Um, I'm looking forward if the Senate confirms uh, the nomination to have the opportunity to do that um, for five more. I think given the things we just talked about, hey, we're trying to make sure that innovation is embedded. We're trying to make sure that, um, that pay equity gets passed and implemented. Uh, it's important to have uh, some consistency of leadership across some of these major, major uh, muscle movements for the agency. 
Um, plus, one of the other things I raised to her attention was um, we need new technology. And uh, right now, on the current path, it's going to take us way too long to get that technology in place. And so we need this technology. We need to put the best tools in the hands of our officers that we possibly can. She agrees with that, too. Um, again, it's, it's like anything else. Um, uh, we need to find the funds to be able to support these initiatives, but we will continue to press that forward. And, you know, as you know, the Secretary is strongly behind uh, these initiatives as well. Um, just a reminder that uh, this coming week is National Police Week, which is the week that um, law enforcement agencies across the country, federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial, uh, remember the law enforcement officers that have been lost uh, over the past year. Um, we uh, had a ceremony at DHS headquarters yesterday where we uh, recognized um, Pham Hennessy, who passed away uh, last year, and two of our canines, because uh, canines and equines, horses, uh, also get memorialized uh, in these ceremonies. And then uh, there will be a series of events. Um, um, some of the most moving are there's a candlelight vigil on the National Mall every year um, that um, uh, the names of every law enforcement officer who passed away the prior year are read aloud. Uh, by senior government officials, and then at the end of that ceremony, everybody gets a candle, and you just l literally light up the entire National Mall uh, with candles. It's, a, it's really, a, really a, a very impactful ceremony. And then there's the National Law Enforcement Memorial Ceremony that's on Sunday, uh, which is the culmination of the week's events. So um, just keep in mind, you know, we have a law enforcement component, thankfully, uh, in TSA. Keep in mind uh, all of our law enforcement colleagues. and. You know, the other thing to, to keep in mind, too, is um, law enforcement work and uh, local police work is hard work. Um, and we just need to, I, I can't imagine living in a community where there wasn't local law enforcement or local law enforcement was so severely underfunded you couldn't really rely on them for security within your own community, within your own family. Um, and so if you get the opportunity this week in particular, just to thank the law enforcement officers that you encounter uh, for the work that they do. We see them in the, ch in the screen checkpoints by regulation uh, all the time. Um, just to, you know, hey, thanks for being a law enforcement officer. It's, it's a very noble service uh, in this country and in your community. So with that, let me, uh, let me end my remarks and let's go to some Q&A, please. And Denise is saying, yeah, you talked too long. Um, <laughs> Um, just time for a few questions today, yep. sir, because you do have a flight to catch. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to start with a couple pay equity questions. First, in a prior town hall, you mentioned that the proposed pay scale changes would likely be implemented to be effective as of January 2023, depending on funding. If H.R. 903 does indeed get passed by Congress sooner than that, is it still a goal to get the changes implemented within 60 days of passage as was once proposed. <laughs> yeah, and, and so a really good question, and uh, it's 90 days. Um, uh, you know, we, if you look at the budget process, budget should pass on the 1st of October, although it never does. 90 days is the 1st of January, so that's how that was calculated. What we said is any pay proposal that passes, uh, we will do, if, if it stays within the current system, we can guarantee getting that implemented in 90 days. If it goes into a different system, that might take us a little bit longer, but we're working on that alternative very hard uh, as well. And, and rest assured, there's nothing I would want to do more um, than to make sure we got that money uh, into your paychecks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Next question. Okay. We know that you've been working really hard for pay equity over the past few years. If this does get passed, what are you going to tackle next? <laughs> uh, tackle next. Um, Two things, uh, I, I would, um, and one's very broad, and, um, and the other is a little bit more specific. Uh, I'll go to the second one first, is to get the technology base refreshed. It's really, really important that we do that for security reasons. It's really important that we do it for uh, officer um, uh, tool reasons, putting, putting the right tools in the hands of our officers. And it's really important we do that for passenger experience reasons. So for all those reasons, uh, I think that's critically important. The other thing that um, I would, emphasize, and this is going to sound a little um, theoretical, I think, to, to some people, but uh, it's critical for, in my view, for TSA at our stage of development, and that is to, you know, I mentioned the uh, Inclusion Action Committee and diversity, equity, inclusion, um, focus on leadership and focus on culture. Put those all together. If you look at the, um, if you look at the strategy we put together in 2018, 
the core values, the mission statement, the vision statement, and then the leadership principles that are in the administrator's intent. Um, I want to work hard to further embed those uh, into the organization. Um, I, you know, I, see, uh, I see here, um, both on the FAM side and on the, on the airport side, the impact um, of, of those principles and, and how uh, work is done in the agency. I think every single person that works in TSA ought to look forward to going to work every single day um, and feel that when they're at work that their contributions are valued um, by, by people, by their supervisors, by their coworkers, by travelers, and that they leave work feeling like they made a difference uh, in the world. And additionally, that if they choose to make this a career, that those career paths are available to them, most importantly. Secondly, that um, uh, it's realistic. And third, that there's active leader engagement to help them achieve those, uh, those career goals. So, you know, I, I just think it's, it's really important for us to solidify some of those just basic core things um, about the agency going forward. And I'm sure, you know, knowing TSA, and one of the things um, that makes working for me in TSA so exciting is every day there's something different. Um, there's a different challenge that, that we face. And um, this agency is, is quite remarkable in its ability to um, see something happen and be able to respond to it and have a response that's really, really good. Um, you know, if you think about over the course of the pandemic, the reviews that we've seen on our response to the pandemic have been very complimentary of our ability to do things very quickly, but modify uh, as we needed to over time. So I just want to really embed those things in the agency. Thank you, sir. A slightly different pay question. How often are COLA and locality pay evaluated? In Tampa, housing costs have increased dramatically and is now comparable to Miami and San Francisco. Is there anything that can be done to ensure the pay is commensurate with the rising costs? Yeah, um, unfortunately, no, uh, this is the honest answer. Um, those systems always lag. Um, uh, I've, I've, you know, I've been a government employee for like 40 years. And uh, I've been through periods where inflation is rising like they are now. Um, the COLA increases never match where, the, where inflation is going. But um, they also don't match it when it's going down either. So you don't see it as inflation is increasing. You benefit by it somewhat as, as the economy recovers and inflation um, uh, subsides a little bit. I, I don't know that you come out at the end completely whole on that, but it, you know, there's a... a, a a rather lengthy process that the Office of Personnel Management uses to figure out what those COLA adjustments need to be. Um, plus, you know, as you know, in our, in our budgeting process, we talk about you know, getting pay equity implemented. Um, just this year in fiscal 22, we didn't actually have a budget until like two and a half months ago. Um, so you know, all the COLA adjustment doesn't take effect until the budget gets passed um, by the Congress. So you know, I, you just really can't rely on COLA adjustments to, um, to do that. But um, the one thing I'd, I'd keep in mind is um, be thankful that there are COLA adjustments because uh, not everybody gets them. And secondly, if you're fortunate enough to become retirement eligible, you do get COLA adjustments on your retire pay for the rest of your life. Um, again, same issue, um, but you're, you're at least getting a COLA adjustment there. So it's, it's not perfect by a long shot, but at least it's an adjustment. Thank you, sir. Uh, switching to some return to workplace and telework remote questions. Mm -hmm. It seems that some program offices are not allowing remote work options for positions at headquarters that can clearly be done remotely. There was mention of an official remote work policy being developed. Is there a status update on that? Um, I don't have a status update on that. I know work continues on it. When we did the reentry plan, we acknowledged that remote work and remote work approvals were going to lag behind um, telework approvals. Um, and so um, that remains to be the case. We want to be very um, um, mindful of the impacts of remote work approvals, um, and, and both positive and negative, but be very mindful because remote work decisions are um, more lasting decisions than telework decisions are. Thank so you. we're still working. Don't, don't worry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And speaking of telework, what is being done to ensure telework eligible employees are being, are all being afforded the same opportunities at different locations? The same, oh, um, yeah, and that's a really good question. Um, and it's very hard to have complete total consistency 
across an organization as big and as, as, uh, as varied in terms of geographic locations and uh, composition of, of, of uh, elements of the organization, size and things of that nature. Um, so what, we, what we've um, endeavored to do is to put guidelines out there that ensure a level of consistency, but there's no way, I've, I've worked this for a long time, there's no way you're ever gonna get 100% consistency from um, a, a decision made in here at Dallas Fort, Fort Worth to a decision made in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. It's just near impossible to do that. But you do want to have them to be reasonably close to each other. Um, plus, uh, I firmly believe in giving local leadership the flexibility to make decisions that make the most sense within those guidelines um, for their area of responsibility. So there will be some variation in that. Thank you, sir. Um, switching gears to focus on the FAMS, we're getting a lot of compliments on the FAMS roadmap. However, there are a few questions asking for some clarity. Could you please help us understand what the new mission and implementation strategy is and what your strategic priorities are for the FAMS future? Sure. Um, FAMS, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, and in, in, uh, in, in Irby is a, a model of this, you know, a critical part of our organization. Um, I, I want to make sure, uh, as does um, Director Stevenson, our brand new director of the Federal Air Marshal Service, I want to make sure that uh, we're integrating our um, screening operations, our airport operations, with our in-flight operations as much as we can, um, and that we're also responding to the changing threat posture that we face. Um, you know, the threat is different today than it was even two or three years ago. Um, it used to be a threat, if you go back further than that, um, closer to 9-11, the threat was based on foreign terrorist organizations and um, their networked ability um, to conduct terrorist attacks around the world. Right now, it's based more, not so much on foreign terrorist organizations, but foreign terrorist inspired domestic actors. Um, so that's a big change. Um, and so we want to make sure that you know, and again, an agile security agency embodied by a professional workforce that we um, represent that agility as the threat changes that how we structure some of our operations changes as well. Um, and if you think about what I just said about the threat, uh, insider threat work is more important now than it was uh, five years ago. And it will probably be more important in two years than it is today. Um, and so we want to take the steps um, to uh, position ourselves to be able to meet that threat uh, in advance uh, of when it manifests itself. Um, the other thing is that this new strategy, which um, uh, Director Stevenson is traveling throughout the country vi visiting FAMS field offices to talk uh, with our federal air marshals at the working level about the strategy. Uh, it's not final, it's still in draft form. Um, just to get their input, we can still make changes to it. Um, but to just convey to them, hey, here, here's the intent um, that we're, we're attempting to accomplish um, how do you see uh, ways that we can still improve on this document still in draft form? Part of it is, um, and I heard a lot about this at the Aileen conference this morning, um, a lot of compliments to TSA on how we coordinate uh, with law enforcement across the board, um, but a request to continue to do that and probably do it even more so because the need for coordination is greater every single year. So um, this strategy attempts to, to do all that. And, um, it will, um, uh, I, I think, get finalized over the next uh, month and a half, two months or so. Yep. Thank you, sir. Yep. We have seen a lot of comms regarding incentives, bonuses, and overtime for screeners, which is great for them. Mm -hmm. But what about extra earning opportunities for others that may want to volunteer at the checkpoint this summer? For example, coordination center officers, FSD staff, compliance inspectors, and others that may be able and willing to help with bins and other needs at the checkpoint. Any thoughts on expanding overtime and other incentives this summer to others? Um, that's, a, that's a really good suggestion, and let me take that back. Great. Thank you. you know, part of the, what, what work is being done by those individuals that uh, is still very, you know, um, Support staff is critical um, to the effective operation of, of any organization. Um, as we um, bring on more people, um, uh, as we have different pay incentives that we need to process, that requires, that drives a lot more work on the support staff's um, side as well. So I wanna make sure that the support end of the organization uh, is still capable to support the operational end. Thank you. Um, well, I note that I just received from Ms. 
Pat Bradshaw, the remote work policy has been issued and is posted on the iShare site. So I wanted to share right, that. How's that for speed? <laughs> And we are running out of time, sir, so we'd just like to end the, um, the Q&A on just a couple of kudos. One, I'm receiving some congratulations for you, sir, on the announcement of your, um, you. your nomination. And then lastly, I received this kudos um, from St. Louis. As you spoke about caring for our people, I wanted to give a special highlight to Team STL. They have been very instrumental with providing support to the team. I recently transferred to STL and soon after transferring, ran into a family medical emergency. The entire team from the FSD to, to the TSOs were all very supportive. So just Great. wanted to share that. Oh, terrific, thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. I appreciate uh, everybody attending here in, in person. Good to see all of you. Um, and I appreciate the uh, online audience and the audience that will view this in the days ahead. And again, thanks for all the great work you're doing across the agency. Um, and uh, like I said, it's going to be a busy summer, uh, but an important summer for the country as we uh, start to come out of this uh, pandemic in a very robust way. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Dan.